Free. He is a minister in the United Reformed Church, and he is the third president of Westminster Seminary, California, where he also is the professor of church history. He's been teaching there since 1981, previously taught at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, as well as Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary and Stanford University. He holds a Master's of Divinity degree from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary and a Master's of Arts and PhD from Stanford University. He lives in California with his wife, Mary Ellen, with whom he has three grown children who also reside in California. Please join with me in welcoming Dr. W. Robert Godfrey. Well, it is great to be here with you, to be back in this uh, fine church and to participate in this conference. This is a very exciting year for church historians. Um, normally, no one is particularly interested in listening to church historians, but uh, <laughs> since this is the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, uh, suddenly church historians are of limited usefulness. And uh, so I am glad to be here and to participate with you in this conference, thinking about one of the truly great themes of the Reformation, namely sola scriptura, or by scripture alone. Is the church reformed? Is the church sustained? Uh, is the church invigorated? And uh, I hope that uh, this conference will not only uh, be informative about uh, our history as uh, uh, Reformed and Protestant people, but it will also be um, uh, a real uh, encouragement for all of us to have confidence in the Word of God and to devote ourselves even more uh, to study studying and cherishing and following uh, the Word of God. Well, the task that I'm given today is to talk about Luther and uh, Sola Scriptura. I understand Mike Horton talked some about Calvin and Sola Scriptura. Um, it's a kind of strange order to do things in, uh, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, 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 Luther uh, is the pioneer, uh, but Luther also, uh, I think, if there are no Lutherans here, I can get away with saying this, uh, is, is not quite the complete systematic thinker that John Calvin was. Um, uh, Luther, I think rightly, is, is called an occasional theologian. Uh, by that, I don't mean he was occasionally a theologian, uh, but that uh, Luther never wrote a full systematic theology. Luther would write on specific theological topics, and he was brilliant on those topics. It's hard to read a page of Martin Luther and not be spiritually edified. Uh, he's really marvelously stimulating spiritually as a writer. Uh, but it is Calvin who I think is able a little more effectively to stand back and get the systematics of the thing right. Um, not always quite as interesting as Luther, if I can be allowed to uh, observe that. Um, uh, Luther uh, always had the common touch. Um, you always felt that uh, he would be very interesting to have a Diet Coke with. Um, <laughs> I'm on my best behavior today. And, um, so Luther and Sola Scriptura. Um, you know, I think often we as Protestants uh, take the conviction of sola scriptura uh, or the uh, articulation of sola scriptura uh, as our Protestant principle a little for granted, and we don't necessarily ask, where did it come from? We may ask, uh, what is sola scriptura? We may ask, how do we defend sola scriptura? We may ask, how do we live out sola scriptura? But one of the great questions we also ought to ask is, where does it come from? Now, of course, the the proper first Protestant answer is it comes from the Bible. It's not something we made up. Uh, it's not something brand new. It comes from the Bible. We can uh, certainly defend that notion. 
Uh, but when Martin Luther came on the scene, he was a pioneer in a church that for over a thousand years had not really understood sola scriptura. He was feeling his way, as he did on many theological topics. You know, that's, that's the challenge of being a pioneer. You're going to someplace kind of new, like pioneers who came to California. Um, the first pioneers didn't know the way. It wasn't because California wasn't there. It's just they hadn't been there. And that's the way it is with Sola Scriptura. I'm not suggesting Sola Scriptura wasn't there in the Bible already. It just had been a long time since the church had gotten there. And so one of the interesting things I hope is for us to trace a little bit together how Luther got there. What was the process that led Luther to Sola Scriptura? Now, Luther was a theologian, and Luther was a preacher before he became a reformer. Uh, he knew a great deal of theology. He taught at the university in Wittenberg in Germany. Um, and he began increasingly to sense a tension between the received theology that he was taught and the church had taught for hundreds of years and what he was finding in the Bible. Because Luther was teaching in the university on the Bible. And uh, he was still, we would say, a relatively young man, but by the standards of his day, he was already middle-aged. He was in his 30s. I mean, that's one foot in the grave in the 16th century. <laughs> when the contemporary of Luther, the great humanist uh, um, Erasmus turned 39, he wrote to a friend and said, I'm now an old man. <laughs> well, life was hard in the 16th century. Uh, but, but Luther, in his 30s, was lecturing on the book of Psalms, the book of Galatians, the book of Romans, the book of Hebrews. Well, you could hardly choose better books if you wanted to become a Protestant even though there weren't Protestants then. So he's, he's studying the Bible intensively, and he's feeling more and more tension between what he's finding in the Bible and what the church has always said to him. Now, the church had taught him, the church had always believed that the Bible was the Word of God. Uh, the church had always accepted the authority of the Bible as the revelation of God. There was no debate about that at the time of the Reformation. There hadn't been any de debate about that in the history of the church for well over a thousand years. The Bible was the Word of God. The Bible was true. The Bible was completely reliable. Everyone believed that who was in the church. But what had happened over hundreds and hundreds of years is that the church had come more and more to depend on the traditions of the church instead of turning directly to the Bible itself. And in that process of depending more and more on the traditions of the church, people really didn't notice that those traditions of the church, rather than summarizing the Bible, was actually taking people away from the Bible. And you can see how that would happen as a kind of gradual process. Um, the Bible can be a little difficult. And it's particularly difficult if you don't have printed books. You can imagine the difficulty that the church labored under when there was not, not yet printing. The, the amount of time and energy it would take to copy out a copy of the Bible by hand. And, and the expense of having paper or parchment or some kind of animal skin. How many animals would it take to provide enough skins to copy out the Bible on? You're talking about a very expensive undertaking. 
And then for a lot of the Middle Ages in the West, a lot of people didn't read. Most people didn't read. So you have this, this huge problem. How do you connect with the Bible if you don't have a Bible and you can't read? And so increasingly, people, even many leaders in the church, became dependent on traditions that they just assumed were the same as the Bible. It wasn't that anybody was intentionally setting the Bible aside. It was they didn't have much access to the Bible, and they trusted the traditions of the church, and they didn't realize that the traditions of the church over more than a thousand years had changed and changed and changed. It's very interesting for me as a historian. I, I sometimes just say it's very interesting, and my wife says, not to everybody. It's very interesting to me as a historian that those most committed to tradition are often those who see change taking place all the time in their traditions. Now, can you really have it both ways? Can you be upholding a tradition and yet constantly innovating? That seems a kind of contradiction, but that's what often happens in the history of the church. And yet people, despite the innovations, or because they don't notice the innovations, assume that what their traditions are is what the Bible must be teaching, and therefore what God wants them to do. That was the situation in which Luther found himself until he began to be able to study the Bible much more directly, much more intensively. Luther lived, should have the exact date, but about 60 years after the invention of printing in the West. And so Luther had the privilege of printed books. Luther had access to printed Bibles. And Luther also had the great privilege of being able to study Greek and Hebrew. Uh, not all seminarians have fully appreciated the profound privilege that is, um, but uh, as any of you who know more than one language will know, when you read something in another language, suddenly there are things that strike you that's never struck you before. Um, my wife is Hungarian, and uh, she's forever saying, there's a great Hungarian word for that. And. Uh, there must be great Hungarian words because she and her mother talk Hungarian a great deal, and uh, the only Hungarian word I've learned is Bob. You know, I, I hear that uh, come up every now and again. But because Luther was now able not just to read the Bible in Latin, which was the uh, language of, of education in Luther's day, uh, but also in Greek and Hebrew, he, he had a great access to a fresh read uh, of the Bible that increasingly challenged him to think, are the traditions I've inherited really right? Now, as, as you know, this is the 500th anniversary of what is usually regarded as Luther's first public act of reformation. On October 31st, 1517, Luther nailed 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg. And um, uh, historians who love to spoil all the good stories, some of them say he really didn't do that, but he did. I think the historians who've tried to say he didn't do that are wrong. Uh, he did nail the 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg, uh, which was a fairly common thing to do in the academic community to suggest that there were topics for debate publicly. And he laid out um, 95 points, brief sentence or two points, of convictions that he was willing to defend in a public debate. Um, for Luther and for everyone in Wittenberg, that was not a radical thing to do. This was done regularly. It would be about as radical as Reverend Tolman posting on the church door tomorrow morning, 
95 theses in Latin. How many of you would be outraged by what he said? You see, that was sort of true in the 16th century. It's a small academic community, a few hundred people that can read Latin in the city of Wittenberg. This is not a revolutionary action. This is an academic invitation to discussion. But some who could read Latin saw the potential for challenging the old order in these theses, and they took the theses, and unbeknownst to Luther, they translated them into German and published them and distributed them, and Luther suddenly found himself a famous person. <laughs> he had been an obscure monk in a small, somewhat out-of-the-way university until that happened. And the issue that Luther raised in those 95 theses were the issue of indulgences. Now, indulgences were a somewhat technical theological point. And in that technical theological point, uh, Luther had a kind of footnote issue to confront. Uh, indulgences were the kind act of the church to make it easier for people in difficulty to experience the full benefits of the sacrament of penance. According to the Roman Catholic teaching of the Middle Ages, in order to be forgiven of your sins through the sacrament of penance, you have to be sorry for your sins, you have to confess your sins to a priest orally, and you have to fulfill the satisfaction that the priest imposes on your sins, which is usually a matter of prayer or of gifts, monetary gifts to the church. Now, some people the church recognized were too old, too weak, too poor to pray or to give gifts. And for those people, the church provided indulgences so they didn't have to fulfill the satisfaction. You see how kind the church is? How full of grace the church is? All you Protestants have completely misunderstood what was going on. <laughs> About 50 years before Luther's time, a pope had been thinking about indulgences and the amount of money they brought in to the church because indulgences had become a significant avenue of revenue for the church. And the pope, a fairly shrewd businessman, figured out that one way to increase revenue is to increase market. And so that pope declared that indulgences could be offered not only to the living, but also to the dead. Well, that increases your market significantly. We mustn't mention this to anyone in Washington or they'll start taxing the dead. <laughs> so when Luther nailed his 95 theses to the church door, all he wanted to debate was this. Was the Pope right 50 years ago to grant indulgences for the dead as well as for the living? That's a pretty narrow issue. Luther said the Pope was wrong to do that. That was an innovation. That was inappropriate. At the same time, Luther said in 1517, but anyone who denies the apostolic character of the indulgences, let him be anathema. He's not attacking indulgences. He's not attacking indulgences for the living. He's not attacking the tradition of the church in the sacrament of penance. He's only attacking the relatively recent innovation of applying indulgences for the dead in purgatory. And he'd been provoked to this, not primarily as a theologian, but primarily as a pastor. Because in neighboring territories, a representative of the Pope, John Tetzel, had been selling these indulgences for the dead. And you all remember, don't you, the, the clever little slogan that Tetzel had? 
As soon as a coin in the coffer clings, another soul from purgatory springs. <laughs> and and the, the emotional abuse Luther felt of the faithful was profound. Think of the, think of the pitch, you know. Are your mother and father dead? Your grandparents dead? Children dead? They're in purgatory, you know, suffering, waiting to be released to heaven. How many hundreds of years will they have to spend suffering in purgatory? You can release them now, immediately, by purchasing a plenary indulgence from the merciful, gracious, kind church. How can you not do that? And that pitch was remarkably successful, and Luther thought it was pastoral abuse. And so he's attacking it. He's not attacking the church. He's not attacking uh, most of its tradition. He's attacking a relatively recent innovation that he thought was spiritually problematic. And suddenly he became famous. He became famous in part because there were many people who already had a lot of anger built up towards the church, feeling it had become rich, corrupt, indifferent, unhelpful. And suddenly, Martin Luther was the Donald Trump of his day. <laughs> uh, whether you like Donald Trump or hate Donald Trump, uh, he got elected because there was a lot of anger in the land about what was perceived as the failures of government. That's sort of what happens with Luther. All of a sudden, he becomes the, the focal point of a lot of anger for what is seen as the failure of the church. And of course, the church pushes back. The church pushes back and says, who is this upstart monk to criticize his betters? Does not this monk realize that this expansion of the benefits of indulgences has been done by the authority of the Bishop of Rome, our Holy Father, the successor of Peter, the vicar of Christ, the vicar of God on earth? Who does Martin Luther think he is to criticize the actions of the Pope? And so for a certain segment of the church, the old church, the issue moved rather rapidly from an issue of indulgences to an issue of the authority of the pope. And of course here, Luther's on much shakier ground. It's one thing to criticize a new innovation only 50 years old, it's another thing to be accused of attacking the authority of the papacy. And so Luther is put in a difficult place. And then Luther receives an invitation to a debate, uh, to a debate that's going to be held in the city of Leipzig. Now, in those days, uh, the part of Germany Luther was teaching in was called Saxony, and Saxony had gotten politically divided into two sections. You'll want to take notes on this because this is the kind of thing that just comes up in, uh, over Diet Cokes. Um, <laughs> so there's Electoral Saxony, the capital of which is Wittenberg, where Luther is, and then there's Ducal Saxony, the capital of which is Leipzig. And these two factions, these two parts of Saxony are ruled over by relatives that don't get along very well. And the ruler of Electoral Saxony, Frederick the Wise, is supporting Luther, and the Duke of Ducal Saxony is opposing Luther. And so to get invited to Leipzig is to be invited into the lion's den. And the invitation goes to both Karlstadt, uh, Luther's colleague on the faculty at Wittenberg, later uh, Karl Stott and Luther will have a falling out, but in 1519, they're still staunch allies. 
And Karlstadt is the senior man, so he gets the invitation first, and then later the invitation comes to Luther, and they're going to debate two topics at Leipzig. That's the proposal. They're going to debate grace, which is a topic that Luther and Karlstadt have been writing on, attacking the Pelagianizing, uh, anti-grace teachings of the medieval church. But then they're also going to deb debate the authority of the pope. Now, debating grace is a somewhat, well, is a very important topic, but not quite so dangerous as debating the authority of the pope. So Karlstadt is invited to come to debate on grace, and Luther's invited to come and debate on um, the authority of the pope. And so Luther draws up some more theses for debate. And the one that particularly caught everyone's attention was thesis 13 for the Leipzig debate. This is the thesis Luther is willing to defend. And uh, the first sentence of this thesis is meant to be sarcastic. The very callous decrees of the Roman pontiffs which have appeared in the last 400 years prove that the Roman church is superior to all others. Against them stand the history of 1,100 years, the test of divine scripture, and the decree of the Council of Nicaea, the most sacred of all councils. So Luther is going to defend the modest proposition that Rome has declared itself authoritative, but that itself is an innovation only 400 years old. That seems like a long time to us. Didn't seem like a long time to them. And against it stands the history of the church, the Council of Nicaea, and the scriptures. That's what Luther's willing to defend. Now, the principal debater on the other side, the old church side, was a theologian by the name of John Eck. Eck is the German word for corner. Uh, he was all corners, John Eck. Very eminent theologian and very devoted to the old church. So in June of 1519, Karlstadt and Luther, accompanied by about 200 armed students, um, travel to Leipzig for this debate. And the students go with them because they're really concerned ab about the safety of their professors. This is a violent age. People are arrested and charged with heresy and are executed uh, in short order. And these students are determined to protect their professors. So off they go. And over the course of a couple of weeks, there's very intense public debate on these themes of grace and the authority of the Pope. And, and we have a description of the combatants in this debate from a contemporary who was there. And I want to read it to you. I have to fill up the time somehow. And, um, <laughs> but it's, it's rather wonderful to see these descriptions of these historic Figures and particularly the description of Luther, um, <clears throat> who is described here by, by this time he's in his late 30s, and uh, he's um, um, described as gaunt, that is skinny. Uh, that's not the way we usually picture Luther. We usually see pictures of Luther much later in his life when he's married and clearly eating well at home. But uh, this is before he's married, and he's a monk, and he's fasting, and he's skinny. So this is the description <clears throat> by someone who was there and, and observed the debate. <clears throat> Martin is of medium height with a gaunt body that has been so exhausted by studies and worries that one can almost count the bones under his skin. Yet he is manly and vigorous with a high, clear voice. He is full of learning and has an excellent knowledge of the scriptures so that he can refer to facts as if they were at his fingertips. He knows enough Greek and Hebrew to enable him to pass judgments on interpretations. He is also not lacking in subject material and has a large store of words and ideas. <clears throat> 
In his life and behavior, he is very courteous and friendly, and there is nothing of the stern, stoic, or grumpy fellow about him. He can adjust to all occasions. In a social gathering, he is gay, witty, lively, every full of, ever full of joy, always has a bright and happy face, no matter how seriously his adversaries threaten him. One can see in him that God's strength is with him in his difficult undertaking. The only fault everyone criticizes in him is that he is somewhat too violent and cutting in his reprimands. In fact, far more than is proper for one seeking to find new trails in theology, and certainly also for a divine. That is probably a weakness of all those who have gained their learning somewhat late. So he's a Johnny-come-lately when it comes to learning, and uh, uh, he gets a little uh, sharp with uh, people who attack him. But generally speaking, he's a nice guy. That's the, the modern summary. The observer goes on to talk about Karlstadt. All this is true of Karlstadt as well, only in somewhat lesser degree, except that he is of shorter statue with a dark brown and sunburned face, a voice indistinct and unpleasant, and a memory that is weaker, and he is more rapidly roused to anger. Um, it's interesting that Karlstadt arrived in Leipzig with a whole wagon full of books because he didn't know what book he might need to refer to. Uh, Luther didn't have books with him because he really had an incredible uh, memory. Um, it's believed that uh, Luther had the whole New Testament committed to memory and large sections of the Old Testament as well. So uh, an absolute phenomenal uh, memory. Uh, the writer goes on, Eck, in contrast, is a great tall fellow, solidly and robustly built. The full, genuinely German voice that resounds from his powerful chest sounds like that of a town crier or a tragic actor. But it is more harsh than distinct. The euph euphony of the Latin language so highly praised by Fabius and Cicero is never heard in his mode of speech. His mouth and eyes, or rather his whole physiognomy, are such that one would sooner think him a butcher or common soldier than a theologian. As far as his mind is concerned, he has a phenomenal memory. If he had an equally acute understanding, he would be the image of a perfect man. He lacks quickness of comprehension and acuteness of judgment, qualities without which all the other talents are in vain. And this is the reason that in debating, he throws everything together promiscuously and without selection, arguments from reason, scripture text, citation from the fathers, without considering how inept, meaningless, and sophistical is most of what he says. He is concerned only with showing off as much knowledge as possible so as to throw dust in the eyes of the audience, most of whom are incapable of judging, and make them believe that he is superior. In addition, he has an incredible audacity, um, however, uh, which, however, he covers up with great craftiness. So here are these three characters. Eck, tall, imposing, bombastic, great memory, but not much judgment. And uh, so he's forever throwing quotations that are impressive as quotations, but don't really relate to the subject at hand. Um, Karlstadt, you can sort of imagine there, uh, kind of uh, short and plump and looking through his books for what he wants uh, as he goes along. And then Luther, young, skinny, phenomenal memory, uh, very pointed in uh, his debate. So this debate uh, takes place, as I say, over uh, a couple of weeks. And um, in those interesting moments in history, um, the debate, of course, is not held on Sunday in between, and uh, on that Sunday, the appointed New Testament reading in the churches um, all over Europe was from Matthew 16. You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The very theme that Luther has been debating over these t two weeks is the theme that has to be preached. The other fascinating thing that Sunday is that Luther received word uh, 
that in the city of Leipzig, only a few blocks away, John Tetzel, the seller of the indulgence from a couple of years ago, is lying dying. And Luther writes him a letter of pastoral comfort and encouragement as he is facing death. So there are a variety of interesting things coming together here at this debate. But the focus for Luther is this question, is the pope the ultimate authority in the church or not? For 400 years, the Western church has said, yes, the pope is the authority. And Luther finds himself increasingly driven into a corner by Eck. Because Eck is revealed in the course of this debate as one who better knows church history. You see, if you don't know church history, you're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Slightly self-serving comment. Um, Eck knows a lot of church history, and he knows voluminous quotations from the church fathers that he can bring to bear in the debate. Luther went into this debate a little naively. Luther went into this de debate really believing that church history and the fathers and the medieval theologians were largely on his side. He knew some quotations from the church fathers, some quotations from the medieval theologians. He knew some church history. But rather quickly, he begins to discover Eck knows more of these things than he does. And when Luther tries to appeal to the fathers and the church and church history, uh, he finds he's not able to make as effective an appeal as Eck is able to do. And what, what does that mean? It means in the course of this debate, Luther is more and more thrown back on the scriptures which he knows much better than Eck. And so he begins to quote the scriptures. He begins to quote what the scriptures say about themselves. He begins to explain what Jesus meant when he said to Peter, you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. He begins to show that from that statement, it's a long way to say that the Pope is the only authority in the, or the ultimate authority in the life of the church. And so Luther is more and more appealing to the scriptures against the appeal to church history and the fathers that Eck is making. And it is really in the course of that debate that it begins to become clear to Luther that one of the great issues emerging in this beginning of Reformation is what is authority in the life of the church? Where is truth to be found in the life of the church? Luther, like all theologians for hundreds of years before him, just sort of assumed that scripture and tradition taught largely the same thing. But now, confronted with Eck and his great memory about the words of the church fathers, he's beginning to find that there's tension between the scripture and the tradition. And he's beginning to be more and more willing to be critical of the tradition but in appealing to the scriptures. The scriptures are encouraging him. The scriptures are strengthening him. The scriptures are directing him. And so he becomes bolder and bolder in his appeal to the scripture against the authority of the Pope. He can make a church history argument. He can say the Eastern Christians, the Orthodox Christians, for a thousand years did not recognize the authority of the papacy and yet were recognized as brothers and sisters in Christ by the Pope. So how can the Pope claim to be the authority in the life of the church. He can appeal to the Council of Nicaea and say the Council of Nicaea knows nothing of the authority of a pope. The pope didn't call the council. The pope didn't chair the council. 
the Pope didn't authorize the decisions of the council, and yet that is the great authoritative council in the life of the church, defending the eternal divinity of our Lord Jesus in 325. He can make those appeals to history in a general sense, but when it becomes more specific, he's thrown back on the scriptures. And this is where Eck, I think, sort of smelled blood. And, and he brought out what has remained to this day one of the great Roman Catholic arguments against Protestantism. And it's this. What makes you think you can understand the scriptures? What makes you think you can understand the scriptures? Or more particularly, what makes you think you understand the scripture better than hundreds, indeed thousands, of priests and bishops and theologians and popes through the history of the church? You are just carried away with your arrogance. You lack that essential Christian virtue of humility. Why would you set yourself against the church, against its history, against its teaching, against its reliability? Who are you? And, and Luther would find this in the next years, a, a recurring issue that he confronted in his own life. You know, in 1521, two years later, he will be summoned to appear before the emperor on trial. And, um, one of the great questions the emperor's representatives put to Luther before the powers of this world, they have his books all piled up. He's written a lot in the, in the four years since uh, uh, 1517. They have his books piled up and they say, will you now recount, recant of the errors in these books? And Luther was sort of prepared for that one. He said, could you give me a list of my errors so I can, uh, and then he thought I can debate each one. Is it really an error? They and they were ready for him. And they said, you're a theologian. You know what your errors are. <laughs> well, you recant. And Luther made his less famous speech at the Diet of Worms. He said, can I have 24 hours to think it over? And Luther spent those 24 hours in prayer, in consultation with close friends, and he said he was agonized by this question that Eck had already sort of begun to put to him at Leipzig. The question is, are you alone wise? Luther, are you the only one who's right? Are you so arrogant that you are prepared to run the risk not only of your immortal soul, but the souls of thousands of your followers that you're leading to hell by your false teaching and rebellion against the church? Are you alone wise? Now, we're 21st century Americans. Nothing seems more likely to us that, than that we alone would be wise. I mean. <laughs> That's an existential question. <laughs> but for a medieval Christian with a profound sense of connection to community and responsibility to community, this was a haunting question for Luther. Am I alone wise? And what he came to as his conclusion when he wrestled with this was, this is not about me. This is about the word of God. I'm not claiming any wisdom. What I'm claiming is that when God sets out to reveal his truth, he can do it successfully. When God sets out to reveal his truth, he can do it successfully. That he does not need a mediator to interpret the meaning of the Bible. <laughs> 
He said, I'm not proclaiming my wisdom. I'm proclaiming what the word of Christ drives me to teach. That's a very important distinction. He says, what the word of God says is unavoidable if you study it. Now, there are a lot of later people, Roman Catholic apologists again, who say, well, if it's so clear, why are you Protestants so divided? If the Pope had ever heard of the United Reformed Churches, he might say, why are there PCA churches and why are there United Reformed Churches? It's not a bad question. But of course, the response, I think, is twofold. Uh, first of all, the theological divisions in the Roman Catholic Church today are at least as big as the theological divisions in the Protestant churches today. So the Pope has failed in his mission to define theology clearly for the faithful. Of course, that's only a kind of negative response. You're as bad as we are. That only goes so far as a defense. It's, it's useful, but it only goes so far as a defense. But I would argue I'd need a little more time than I have, but I would argue that if we gather together genuinely Bible-believing Christians, most of the time we find a remarkable level of unity when it comes to the doctrine of God, when it comes to the doctrine of Christ, when it comes to the doctrine of grace, when it comes to the doctrine of faith. We may have our differences on sacraments or on eschatology. But for all of us, there's a recognition these are not the fundamental saving issues of the gospel. We are united as Bible-believing Protestants on the great saving issues of the gospel. And so this notion that we are so terribly divided, I think is overstated. I'm willing here publicly now to say, I think there are true Christians in the PCA. <laughs> you see, we, we laugh because it, it's an absurd proposition that I wouldn't think PCA folk are, are real Christians. We are united by bonds of faith in Jesus Christ. And so, no, perhaps we have not been able to solve every issue out of the Bible together. But we are committed that the Bible is the only way that we'll ever be able to solve those issues. It's by sitting with the Bible, studying the Bible. You know, when the um, debate at Leipzig was completed, they prepared a transcript of the debate and they sent it off to um, the uh, University of Paris, to the Sorbonne, to the theologians there, to render a verdict on, on who won. It took the Sorbonne several years to issue their verdict because uh, they didn't want to get in a lot of trouble. Um, but the verdict of the theological faculty at the University of Paris is very interesting because they begin by saying, number one, the scriptures are obscure. Now there's an official statement of a, a Roman Catholic theological faculty. What is the character of scripture? It's obscure. Number two, the scriptures cannot be used by themselves because they're obscure. The scriptures must be interpreted by masters, especially by the masters of Paris. So the scriptures are obscure, and the only way you'll understand them is by going to the theologians at the University of Paris. Reflecting, of course, a centuries-old competition between the universities and the pope. <laughs> 
You notice the University of Paris isn't talking about the Pope as the interpreter. They're talking about themselves as the interpreter. And, and what Luther would say in response is, the scriptures are obscure. Doesn't the scripture itself bear witness over and over that the scriptures are a light to our path? You see, the Leipzig debate is really just one episode in the centuries-long great debate that began in the garden, didn't it? Has God said? You know, Eve, the real problem you face is that what God said to Adam isn't clear. It isn't true. It isn't what you need. Let me interpret it for you. Let me apply it for you. And so through the whole history of the church, the evil one has come to say the scriptures are obscure. The evil one tried that in the garden with our Lord, in the wilderness with our Lord, didn't he? Our Lord quoted the scriptures to the evil one. And what did the evil one say? Then he said, it is written. He will bear you up by the angels, lest you dash your foot against a rock. And what did Jesus respond? He responded, well, that scripture is obscure. <laughs> no, he didn't, did he? Jesus responded, um, let me check with the theologians at Paris about that. <laughs> you know, there are any number of things Jesus might have said in response. He might have said, I wrote this book, don't tell me what it means. <laughs> but what does he respond? He responds, it is also written. And he establishes there for all time the only path to truth amongst Christians. That is to compare scripture with scripture. To ask what is written. To have confidence that what is written is the truth that will guide us into all truth. And so I understand that uh, there are here in this gathering both pedo-baptists and baptists. Now, how can we rescue the Baptists from their errors? <laughs> or because I'm kind of slightly charitably inclined today, how Baptists might think, are pedo-Baptists to be rescued from their errors? <laughs> I would suggest there's only one way to ever have any hope of solving that problem, and that's that we continue to sit together and study the Bible together. That's what Jesus intended. Because the word is a light to our feet. Jesus reminded us we shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so we're engaged, whether we want to be or not, in that ages long great debate. Has God said? And the only way to know what God has said is exactly what Martin Luther did at Leipzig, to turn again to the Bible and to find there the light, the truth, and the way. Thank you. Um, let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for your word. And we bow before it, acknowledging, O oh Lord, that it is your light for us. It is your truth for us. And although we are sinful and finite and therefore do not always understand it as we ought, we acknowledge that the fault is in us, not in your word. And so we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that word might become ever more precious to us, that we might be ever more devoted to it, and that it might live in us to draw us to Christ. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen.